tem olhado para a política do Dr. Cecília do Human Rights Data Analysis Group, grupo de análise de dados dos direitos humanos. E o Patrick tem um trabalho pioneiro na lançada de métodos quantitativos aplicados na área dos direitos humanos. É uma carreira longa que começou aqui, começou na América Latina, em El Salvador, no início dos anos 90. E é, 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 é meio impossível resumir quase em três décadas de atuação profissional em um minuto, mas eu queria destacar duas Jornalismo de dados. Né? Primeiro é o desenvolvimento de métodos, o Patrick foi pioneiro na aplicação de métodos de diferentes estatísticas, métodos de investigação de direitos humanos, é, ou traduzindo o que está no falado, na aplicação de métodos que nos permitem construir uma ponte entre o que a gente vem nas nossas famílias, nas nossas bases de dados, e o que, e que realmente acontece no mundo. E o segundo aspecto é a aplicação desses métodos. O Conselho de Investigação do Patrício já contribuiu com diversas comissões da verdade, de tribunais internacionais, em países como El Salvador, Etiópia, Antia, Sanchez, Serra Leoa, Peru, Cuba, Chile, Inglaterra, Guatemala, a lista gigante poderia continuar falando aqui, mas acho que já deu para a gente ter uma ideia da noção de um pouco da relevância internacional do trabalho do Patrício. E hoje ele vai compartilhar alguns resultados da gente que trabalha na Comissão da Verdade na Colômbia sobre acidentes nos Estados Unidos e violência policial nas Filipinas. Violência policial é um tema bastante importante para a gente aqui no Brasil. E, como um parênteses final, além desse trabalho de currículo notável na área de estatística, o Patrick também tem um trabalho muito interessante com instalações de arte e tecnologia em ambientes imersivos. Infelizmente, a gente não vai conseguir ver esse lado da atuação profissional do Patrick hoje, mas quem sabe, no futuro, a gente consegue descobrir essas outras facetas. Então, enfim, é um prazer, uma honra receber o Patrick aqui no Brasil, no Brasil, no qual desse ano, e ter a oportunidade de aprender um pouco mais sobre esses métodos que exigem esse projeto de investigação que a gente vai ver. Em próximos lembretes, novamente, a gente tem a tradução simultânea, quem ainda não chegou, corre lá. As perguntas, vocês entregam para a equipe da produção que vai estar passando aí, não se esqueçam de se identificar também. Então, por fim, queria pedir uma salva de palmas para receber o contato do Código de Patrícia.
must have all of those things and we must then forget it. And I want to say, it's really, really hard. It's really, really hard. It's really cool to have the same thing. the people I've argued against. I was an expert witness in the trial of the Lord of the Lord. And I was an expert witness in the trial of the world criminal in the bottom. So that's the world criminal brand. There's two. Uh, only one of them was ever prosecuted, uh, and that was not the the president of the uh, He was convicted of prosecuting the United States against the United States. So, before I move to the next slide, I want to be clear that I have a statistician, and I think statistics are very important. But statistics are not the most important thing. The most important thing is always the voice of the community, the voice of the people who are stuck at the bottom. This is just a footnote. This is just, it's just a little piece of evidence in a big story. And it's not good enough. Because it's the piece that, that the average person will take if it's not good enough. That's not good enough. So it's not good enough. So why is it so hard? Well, what do we know? Well, we know things that people say. We collect data from the state, we collect data from uh, investigations, we collect data from the voice of the victim. What do we know? And this is the piece that we're exercising to today. That the most important data is the data that we don't have. The data that's hidden from us. And the reason it's so important is because the data we don't have is almost certainly different from the data we do have. When we think about how we have data, the first thing we think about is how was this data produced? How did it how did it happen? Where where was it created? Who created it? I'm not talking about the device. I don't really care about that. What I'm talking about is what were the logistical facilities of the group that they had? Did they have a lot of cars? Did they drive everywhere that they needed to go? Or did they only have one day? Or were they just about Could they reach the communities they wanted to talk to, or were they unable to reach them? When they did reach those communities, did the communities trust them? Did the communities tell them their story, or did they just talk to them? These are the kinds of factors we have to think about when we think about why is data hidden. This is data about the most terrible things that ever happened to anyone. People are being deceived, people are tortured. People are kidnapped, people are raped. It is logical that people would not want, the survivors would not want to talk about this. And yet, if we want to work with that group of community, we want to help them, we need this information. But we cannot say to them that we have to tell them. Instead, we should respect them and think about how can our statistics reflect reality even when we only get some of this stuff. So I'm going to tell you a few stories about that today. First, let me tell you a little bit more about the topic. Okay. Let's imagine that we get three data sets. Okay, perhaps we're talking about homicide and drug at the moment. Okay, not so easy about that. And we have a data from the Catholic Church. They collected a data set of people who have been victims of homicide in the context. We have another data set by the NGOs of the Vatican. And they have collected very valuable data on victims of homicide. We have a third data set provided by the Truth Commission and the Truth Commission collects it, a list of victims of homicide. So we have three data sets. We can combine the data sets and determine which victims are in the same, or in different data sets. We can do the things. We can link the same people across the data sets. Okay? And that allows us to have a Venn diagram like this, where we know these people. We know the intersections between the data sets. Okay, so the white circles tell us what we know. Wait, what do we not know? Is the true world, the real world, the world we can't see, is the real world like the left, where we only know a third of reality, or is it like the right, where we know a third of reality? Well, this is a problem. And it's not just a problem because we want to know the magnitude. It's not just a problem because we need to know the total number. I'm not very interested in the total number. But I'm very interested in the comparison between categories. For example, in Peru, when I worked with the 15th century back in Greece, one of the most important 
assignment the commission has to make is what is the relative proportion of responsibility between the gorilla of the male and the and the agent of the state. Who's committed more crimes? What is the relative proportion of these two? Now, throughout the war of Latin America that we have looked at, and still before 2003, in most cases, the state committed all the public to Guatemala and Salvador. In Argentina and Chile, we're looking at situations where the state committed almost all the actions and the insurgents, like the guerrilla force, committed 3%, 5%, maybe 7%. Tiny fractions relative to the massive amount of responsibility. And what we discovered in Peru is that while we have about the same number of records, the same number of men, individual people, killed by the state, and individual people killed by the state. We could learn from statistical models that the Sierra Leone committed about half again more, about 50% more crimes than the state. So they have committed even more crimes than the state. Now, how did we do that? I'm going to show you in a few points. But I want you to hold this, this idea that in this incredibly important historical comparison between the army and the state, if we just looked at the white circle, we would be wrong. We would misunderstand. We need data and get the story right. So how can we do that? How can we do that? Let me start talking about this book. Let me just take that note. Let's see the algebra. This is my favorite part. I'm sure you will have it. Here we go. It's a tiny bit of algebra and a tiny bit of probability. This is not how we do it, but this is an example of the logic that we do. I want you to imagine some population of people who have been sent to So, from an example, and then you later in the talk, all the people who are killed by police in Manila between 2017 and 2019. And that's one population defined in a specific region in a specific state. Okay. We don't know how many there are. We don't know how many people are killed. So we'll call that number N. We do know that we have a list. We have a list of people who've been killed that was published, say, by a local NGO. That is documenting the death and then writing down the names of the dead. We'll call that list N. We have another list. It is in the same community, but here it is. The police published a list of people they have to do. We'll call that list E. We can put the list together, and I'm not going to explain any comfort of those questions in the next 10 minutes. We determine which deaths are in both lists. And so that the duplicated list, we will call it N, the intersection of any of Okay. Now we need a little bit of probability. Just a tiny bit. If I throw a coin and I ask you, what is the probability that this coin that I'm throwing is given to you? The probability that something happens on the number of ten divided by the size of the population. So it's a little bit more complicated than that, but I think it's pretty So the probability that a death in this population N appears in the list A is the number of people in A divided by the number of people in A. We don't know them, but we do know them. So the probability that is equal to the same thing for B. We know how many people in B, we can divide by N, that's the probability that is that in the population A is documented by B. Now, N is the same. We know N as well. So we can say that the, that the probability that is that is documented by both A and B is N over N. Here's where it gets complicated. If I throw two points and I ask you the probability that I'm throwing two points, that is equal to the probability that I see the first point, one over two, multiplied by the probability I see the second point, one over two, which is one over four. Another way to think about this is that we can enumerate all the possibilities. We can have two heads, we can have two shoulders, we can have heads and tails, or we can have four possibilities. And I ask, what's the probability of the head head? One over four. So the probability of two in the piece of eight is equal to the product of the first probability and the second probability. 
So the probability that a plot in any is documented in both projects is equal to the probability that it shows up in the first project multiplied by the probability that it's in the second project. So, the probability of n is equal to m over n, but it's also equal to a over n times b over n. Now we have an equation. We do some very simple algebra. We multiply both sides by n squared and divide by m. n is equal to a times b divided by n. We can clap for algebra, huh? I mean, come on, that's really cool. We just learned something just with math, just with math, that we didn't know before. Now, that's an estimate, and an estimate is subject to error or error. And you can calculate that, and I'll talk about that later in the talk. But the important thing to understand now is that when I use the phrase a model, when we say we must model what we don't know, I'm talking about something that is in its very simple form, this question, this is the simplest possible model I can think but this is a model. And this model enables us to go beyond the data to try to begin to understand what it is. And that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to show you three things of the model. Now, the first of the models I want to talk about is terms like three to the number of And here we'll use this to look at the bit in the example. And it turns out that in the United States, even the city of Congress would like to know how many people are talking about the name? Why do you know what that means? Because there is no requirement that the police report homicides. That's different to different states. In Texas, in California, in Texas, there is a requirement to report to the municipalities. So, how do you know? And so, you just don't know. So, in 2002, the federal government passed a law that said that the Bureau of Justice Statistics by the U.S. Department of Justice would be the U.S. government has to use the media to figure out how many deaths there are. I don't know, completely not. So we have two lists at that point because the FBI keeps a list. This is really terrible, and I can explain to you what the FBI keeps It's really, really terrible. And then we also have lists from the media. And so when they hired the Bureau of Justice, they just hired some consultants and they said, okay, we can use maps and what that says. We put the two lists together and then dive in, and we do the multiplication, and we get a number of about 7,400 deaths over a period of uh, uh, 2003 to now, and 2011 to now, 2010. <laughs> this is the federal government in one case, and we're going to have to Okay. So, what happens? Well, the problem is that there are some really important mathematical assumptions that we need to model. And if you use models, and you don't respect those assumptions, you'll get the wrong answer. But you've got the wrong answer. And one of the things is, let's talk about the best test we can get in a previous class. In a previous class, I told you that the probability of an event made up of two independent events is equal to the probability. Okay. The probability that a death occurs that shows up in the media is not independent of the probability. Yeah, and this is another of the concepts I've heard people bring to my talk. Social capability determines the data available to And we repeat this. Social capability determines the data available. If something is very visible to the body, you'll see it about the data. If it is not, you won't. Here's the example that we often use in the future. When a middle class was a children of the in the middle, in public, the entire world will know about this before you know. But when a peasant is killed three days off from the road at night, the world will never hear about it. Now, it is popular to say, well, you know, it's like the media, and everyone just says, oh, that's all different. It's not different at all. Because the difference is not about technology, the difference is about people's relationships socially, the social connections. And the relationship to the public. I'll talk about the questions that I'm happy to give you an example from the UN State. I've been working with that public in Congo, where I've worked in 2010. However, if we reverse this problem by using analysis of correlations between databases, which we do from five of our five countries we work with, we determine that the likely total number of shows does not have the organ, but rather that 10,000. And the reason that's important. That if we don't divide by the number of years, we get about 15 
1,500 deaths per year. 1,500 homicides per year in the United States by today. Now, let me go to the other point that I want you to take away from this And that is, numbers by themselves don't really tell us that much. If I tell you 1,500 homicides by today in the U.S., the reasonable question is, is that a big number or a small number? What, what is that number? America's a big country, we have a lot of homicides, is that a big number or a small number? Okay. Of all the homicides in the U.S., every day, there are about 15,000 to 17,000 homicides in the U.S. About three or four days, 75% of those homicides occur between people who know each other. Victims, women victims of homicide are also victims of the peace of partners, of the family members. Male uh, homicide victims are also victims of uh, perpetrators who are family members or young drivers or other people they know before the homicide. People they are acquainted with. So that means one quarter of homicides are committed between strangers. Of all the stranger homicides, only one third of them are committed by police. So that's the comparison important here, is to think about it. Is one third of all cities of homicides committed by police a reasonable number, or is that an unreasonable number? Now, that's where my work as a statistician ends and the work of an advocate begins. But I think that the key that I want you to take away from this constant conversation is that first, we don't stop with the data. We start with the data. And we have many steps before we get to that step. To figure out what we're missing and how to figure it out. The second thing I want to take away from that is that it's not enough to estimate a total number because no one knows what that means. You have to put it in some kind of context, which is often a comparison with other numbers. So let me give you another example of my next one. So I'm going to move on to the book. So, how is my language? Put up your hand if you understand what I'm saying. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about a, 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 a study that I published with uh, some students and faculty at the uh, Columbia, Columbia Journal School in New York City. Uh, and we used data from eight sources to analyze killing by police in the Philippines. Okay. And this is published in lots of different places. There are technical reports on the website. So first, I want to start with something that we talked about earlier. It's actually that that by Andrew and Tuck, that's like Rupert, that they did a group of the study. So it's not a group of the study. And what this graph is, is a Venn diagram. But a Venn diagram doesn't really work if you have more than two circles. If you have more than two circles, the combination of circles becomes so complicated you can't read it. So what if you have eight circles? Okay, this is a graph that shows you that. And so I'm going to read this back to you, and I want to, you to think about it, particularly uh, the colleagues that we talked about that in the session that got produced last year that I did today. I want you to think about this particularly, and I think it may provoke some ideas for you. So, the first column here is the number of killings documented only by the police. The names of their victims because they were uh, ordered by the president of the Philippines to kill people involved in the drug war. So we have a six column here, only the police. The next one we just re reported in the media, but not in any other sources. This one by one of the NGOs, another NGO, another NGO. Now here we have the killings reported by the police and by the news. And here we have the news and by a group of academics, university professors. Here we have the news in one of the NGOs, and so forth, and so forth. And you can see sometimes we have a death that appears in two sources. Other times we have a whole graph here, a, a big plot from three sources, and so forth. And you can have quite complicated interactions. My question for you, and for anyone who's using data from one source, if you're using only one source, which source works? Which source is the music? And what relationships might it have with other sources? And 
does your source represent all of the universe that you're talking about, all of your stuff? Does it only represent the much of the universe you're talking about? Does it only represent white people? Does it only represent black people? Does it only represent poor people? Or does it only represent the black Where is the focus of the data? This is not a criticism. I do not criticize the data. It's very hard to collect data. And I respect and honor everyone who collects data. But collecting data is not the same as collecting data. It is the first step. And to understand what the data says to us, we have to understand how the data says to us. So don't stop when you get one day. Keep going. You get a day and a And then ask, how do all these different data sets tell us a different story about the reality? Don't ask which one is right. That's not a good question. The right question is, what do we learn from each one? Because we might learn something different. We might learn that one data set is just a subset of another data set. So it's really different. Or we might learn that one data set looks like one community and another data set looks like a different community. But we have to ask, what do we learn? Now, one of the things that we learn is we can estimate the world. Now, I'm a baby in statistics. See, how many people in here know what baby is? Quite a few, quite a few, but still a minority of the In Bayesian statistics, our focus is not to create a single number, but rather to understand the distribution of probability around that. We're not interested in what the total number is, but rather, what does the whole curve look like? Now, in this curve, I'll just talk really loud. I hope it works. And there's a single point here, which will put in the data. One of the data sets. And so we can ask, what is the story that the map wants to tell? Use it only some of the data. But for our purposes today, this is the story. We see that there's a You know, it's 
that the police admitted. But when the police did not admit, when the police said this was not a homicide, there were many, 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 many more unidentified homicides, undocumented homicides. And if you were arguing, he was arguing that the police are using the drug laws to commit their own crime. This is the evidence of the police. Because what he could say is the police called a lot of homicides. And you can ask questions about that. And I think that this is this is why it's interesting. Because not just the magic, not just the total magic, but keep going into the end and say, all right, what can we do? What can we do? Well, it doesn't tell us anything, but it gives the investigators something important. Okay. So this is the slide that I've been working on. This is the slide that I've been working on. This is the slide that I've been working on. This is the slide that I've been working on. I was working in Columbia. I was just about to work in 2020. What was the one that I was el proyecto fue en Colombia. Y fue un proyecto que se creó con las tres o dos de los tres partes del sistema de justicia internacional establecido por el acuerdo de paz entre el PAC y el PAC. Y en esta estructura de justicia internacional, Pudiera una comisión de la verdad y también una, una estructura de jurisdicción de corte para dar amnistía judicial al liderazgo de la de la de la México y también del PAN. Se llama la JEP, la jurisdicción de la verdad. Para este proyecto, uh, mi grupo está acá, junto con 25 analistas de la JEP y la comisión de la verdad. Uh, combinamos ups, combinamos uh, datos de todo el parque de la sociedad colombiana, incluyendo más de 125 artículos con uh, de más de 42 fuentes de información que se pueden ver a la Procuraduría de la Nación, incluyendo a uh, los sitios de la Nación, incluyendo Yeah. 
tuvimos que estimar la situación de los los que cayeron totalmente fuera de eso, los de los indicadores. Y tercero, porque tenemos que estar listos, tuvimos que focalizar el incidente, las medidas de variante. Porque cuando hagamos una estimación, la gente viene con un estacionamiento o con variante. Y esto nos da la capacidad de distinguir el incidente de una forma estructural y económica. Y para mí, lo que es que no es Porque queremos distinguir entre una cifra que realmente es válida y una cifra que es pequeña. Y es importante entender la diferencia. Variante es un elemento para entender la diferencia entre los efectos de la sociedad. Voy a dar dos ejemplos y termino. Primero, este es un análisis de cometidos que va a dar por dos dimensiones. Primero, el grupo de la parte, el grupo de la parte, el Pero también son dos o dos o tres elementos. En negro, los equipos plenamente identificados. Estos son los equipos que fueron fotógrafos. Pero bien, no es así. En azul, estamos tomando en cuenta la información pasante. En este caso, es información pasante con la dimensión de vínculo con el que se toma y también procesador. Entonces, tomando el tipo de cuenta y modelando las postulaciones que sean la implicación múltiple, pero no es un tipo de nivel jurídico, es un tipo de estadístico, técnico. Y también usando otra información, usando un modelo de inteligencia digital para extraer el tema del texto de los tipos condicionar este modelo, este modelo para darnos un, un rango probable para cada grupo. Y tercero, en verde, incluimos los dos puntos y además estimamos la, uh, la cantidad de registros que salieron afuera, los víctimas y los personas, los que fueron nombrados en el anónimo o no nombrado. Y en verde y azul, digamos, se llama el intervalo de credibilidad, que es lo que la región barriana de un intervalo de confianza, como en el sentido clásico. El hallazgo principal aquí es que estamos hablando de los niños de Colombia, el procesador central, fundamental y primero con los años. Más o menos, si quieren estar en violencia y legal, en Colombia, en los partidos y los niños, se va a entender dos uno. Tres partes por paralizar, dos partes por la teoría, incluyendo toda la teoría, no solo en este parte, pero toda la teoría, tres partes, dos partes y un parte del Estado. Bueno, podemos tener un debate analítico si el Estado es el único distrito de los paralizados. Es otra cuestión, pero no es mi cuestión. Mi cuestión es determinar según el reporte, el reporte de las víctimas, quién es cuál, y el que es el paralizado. La línea negra, azul y verde representa las cifras de insectos. Y podemos ver que la violencia en un tipo es de 98 más o menos de 200. ¿Okay? Y podemos ver que hay mucha incertidumbre, mucha, mucha incertidumbre sobre la, la cantidad de magnitud y violencia en la cabeza, pero esta incertidumbre va reduciendo eh, después de cinco cortes de su comodidad de edad. Cuando tuvimos más y más y más datos, no existe la cadena que tuvieron más cometido, sino existe ya más datos. Tenemos menos y menos proporción de información bastante. Entonces, cuando, cuando la proporción de datos acerca a uno, comparado con la, el total, es el que se va a Entonces, son dos variables que me encantaría estar tocando, pero es que como a un nivel alto, hay muchísimas más personas que no se pueden estar disponibles que se pueden estar No es caso de estar disponibles. Si ustedes quieren que análisis de la violencia en Colombia, todo lo va a tener la ya sin publicar. Y para mí, lo mejor de eso es que fue publicado por Dana, que es la agencia oficial de política social del Estado de Colombia. El Estado de Colombia ya está tomando la responsabilidad para ese caso que estamos uh, proporcionando los datos. Los datos se incluyen en la fórmula para que ustedes puedan beneficiar de los trabajos uh, llenando los datos pasantes. Pero, ¿verdad? 
Bom, eu vou fazer a pergunta em português, bem devagar, que é uma coisa que eu não fazer, mas eu queria que você pudesse comentar. É, a gente está numa conferência de jornalismo de dados, e no jornalismo de dados, a gente está na fase de totalidade da gente, e que a gente tem que tomar essas amostras de conveniência. Essas visões limitadas e estruturalmente em recortes enviesados da realidade. É, como que você vê o desafio de recortar é, sobre a realidade em grande dificuldade? Em situações onde, tanto, digamos, não, não existe uma necessidade de dar para fazer o que você não pode fazer o que você não pode fazer. Ou o poder ser usado mais específico da realista, onde não há conhecimento, ou não há tempo, ou não há é, condições de recurso para atender a mesma coisa que está acontecendo. Então, é melhor não, não falar nada, ou é, que tipo de salvaguarda, que tipo de sistema é, poderia ser feito. Okay. I think I really do. Because it's hard to know what you don't know. And let me tell you the story. Uh, the United Nations working in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, working on the World Trade System Summit. If you have anyone here who's heard of the World Trade System Summit, Here's the story that was sent to the Congo, so I was here in Grupo de Malicia, in Congo, Texas, to get to know a new guy. So I was there to get to know a new guy. So I was there to get to know a new guy. Okay. Now, what is English or in Spanish? English? English. Okay. English is that. Sorry about that one example. Okay. So, I worked in the Congress for years, and I worked for the human rights part of the ministry. And I think this will get directly to the question of how dangerous is it to use a convenience factor, the data that you can find. You found it, you don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. Here's the thing. So we worked on the one of the activities that one militia group, the World Trade System Summit. It's a terrible group. They do a lot of violence. And then we had one team. Dedicated to just tracking that. Okay, tracking all the violence by the group. And that's in a very remote little village in the far northeastern part of the country. It's hard to get there, and it's very difficult to say where to get there. And there are six people on that team. Now, so let's imagine that one month in March, they worked really hard and they went out on little motorbikes to little villages and they I uh, went and visited everywhere in the world, and they documented 100 cases in the month of March. They documented 100 cases of killings by the world trade system. Okay? And they wrote it all up in the UN format and structure, very careful documentation, and they sent it to the team in Kinshasa, in the capital. That's where I was working. And we would process these reports into summaries and analysis. We would send it on to the Security Council in New York. And then the staff member of the Security Council looked at it and said, okay, March 100 cents. Okay, great. Now, in the United Nations, if you work in a very difficult place, you are required by the rules of the United Nations, every eight weeks, you have to take two weeks of leave. And you have to leave the country. Okay. So in March, we were all there. But in April, half the team went on for two weeks. So we really were missing the team for a lot of years. Okay. So they still, the people who were still there, they worked really hard. They went out of their little motorbikes. They documented every case that they could find. They came back. They wrote it all up. They sent it to Kinshasa. We wrote it up. We sent it on to New York. And New York looked and said, oh, there's only 40 cases in April. Maybe things are getting better. Okay, come on. The team only worked half as hard, and we had fewer than half the cases. The number of cases is so much greater than the capacity of the team that 
the size of the team determines the number of picks that you can put. A bigger team will find more, a smaller team will find fewer. What happens if a naive reader, let's say, is a big example, which is about as naive as it gets, honestly. What happens if a naive reader thinks that, okay, well, it's going down, but well, they'll get the story completely wrong? And this happens all the time. If there's another question, I'll give you an example from the rock. If there's another example, I can give you an example from the rock models. This happens all the time. That the relationship between what we know and what is true changes all the time. I gave you one example from Peru. It doesn't just change in a country, it changes the different parts of the country. And because the point is consistent, we need to understand the comparison, the relationship between different kinds of quantitative components. More in March or more in April. If we're not we're going down, it's a comparison. Both March and April have to have the same logic. They have to have the same amount of documentation. That's never the case. That doesn't happen in English. So the risk that you have, the risk that you face, is you just need data. Is that you're just believing a lie. You're not believing a lie because the data is false. I believe all the data. But I, I know there's more data. And that's Hidden data is the part that's wrong. It's just hidden. And it's changing what I see. And I think that if I want to be a good statistician, I have to get past what I see to get to the whole thing. Now, what can you do about it? Well, you have to use those methods. I showed you one method here. There are several others. And you have to think about it. what are we trying to do with the data? What is the argument we're trying to make? Now, one of the questions that was presented here is well, maybe you could try to explain Say, well, you know, according to the, the, the reports presented to the state system, and this is what I said, and I wrote the statistical factors to the state system in Haiti and in South Africa and Guatemala, and all of our paragraphs where we had a conclusion is according to the reports given to the commission. What does that mean? What if we had said that in the Congress? Well, here's what's the problem. We did say that. The guys, the people working in Wimbledon, in the little village, out in Texas, they said, well, look, we're only half staff. Sorry, we didn't get it all. They write that. That's the secret from get to Kinshasa. And then the other thing is like, well, I'd like to check that out. I'm like, no, no, that's the most important part of the report. Like, well, okay, we'll leave it in, but we'll make it a footnote. And they get to New York, and the Security Council staff person just makes a little picture. And it says, March 100, April 40. And that's what they give to the Security Council. So, so you can pretend that your discoveries are important, but no one will read them. I have read many human rights reports that start out with a beautiful disclaimer, and then by the conclusion, they forgot their own disclaimer and then make them very strong conclusions. You can't even remember the disclaimer when you wrote it. So no one will remember it if they're reading it in someone else's report. You have to assume, you have to know, that people are just going to read your facts or your paper. So that has to be self explanatory or something else. In fact, in my team, we refer to that as the caveat fallacy. Um, my thing is, my question is, the last few points I would like to, I think, one thing I would like to do. My question is, I think, we have heard it, we have heard it, but my question is, I have come to report that uma prevalência de violência afetando um grupo que é difícil de, de alcançar, é, como, se é, como se está baseado em uma amostra não probabilística. Eu acho que talvez precise um teste. Não sei se tem que ter um teste de situação. Eu posso fazer um teste de situação. Não, não. O não probabilístico é muito grande. You need to fill in the three. Or you need something else. You can't do the analysis, certainly not on Kabbalah, which is a very special word. The Kabbalah is a magic word, and that's what you have to do with it. So you have to be very careful about what you mean by Kabbalah. Kabbalah usually means the ratio, or the proportion, or the percentage of something that's certainly not on the other side. Okay. You need to know the population. How big is the population? Okay, that, that's sometimes something you can find. We, if we know the size of the population and we have a non-probability sample, 
what else can we do? Okay, we can do something called uh, proportional classification, right? which is a fairly easy technique. If you have a data set, let's say that you can make it very simple, you know what the proportion is of, let's say, homicides, let's use this one, by sex. So you know, and I'm going to assume that homicides are two sexes. That's not correct, but most of the sex are not two sexes. Okay, I apologize for that. I don't mean to say that I think that it's just two sexes, but in my data, I have only one set of data, and then more than two sexes. So in the future, I'm going to get more. So you have two sexes in your data set. And you can look at the census and say, okay, in this community, there's about 50% women and 50% men. Okay. In my data, it's 80% men and 20% women. Is that reasonable or is that unreasonable? Okay. Now, you could say, no, I believe that the proportion of victims is the same. Okay. Then you could treat each of the records of men as slightly less than one, and each of the records of women as slightly more than one. You can say, wait. And proportionally satisfy your your data set so that the total that you estimate is 50 50. So you change the proportion. Now that would not be legitimate if you were analyzing sex because you would have changed it. But if let's say you were analyzing age, and the age of the women in the data in the data set is much younger than the age of the men are older, by adjusting by sex, maybe you get a better estimate of age. But notice that what you've done is introduce an assumption. You introduce the assumption that the distribution of victims and true distribution, which you don't know, you're assuming, is 50 50 men and women. So, one of the things you can do is introduce an assumption. But if you introduce an assumption, you have to be very, very clear with yourself, primarily, what it produces in the data. And then you need to go looking around for other data that can either confirm your assumption or reject your assumption. But you, the, the problem is, if you have only one data set, you really don't know very much. And so you go, you're going to need more information. That may be another data set, it may be something else, it may be rich qualitative information that will enable you to make a good assumption. But you have to do something. You can't just sit there with one data set and do statistics because you have no idea. You don't have to try to help. Thank <laughs> you. So the 
question of that uncertainty always depends on what exactly is the comparison that you're making in order to figure out if there's a difference. Here, so the difference between the FARC and the paramilitary, the uncertainty is actually quite small. And we can make that decision quite easily. The paramilitary is still uh, many, many more people, almost twice as many as the FARC. Now, when you add the other zero in the other end, it's a little different, but just comparing the paramilitary and the FARC, the paramilitary is still about twice as many, it's a more than twice as many.